Thank you very much for all for staying and for, uh, for this amazing panel. We have now come to the point uh, of uh, the afternoon keynote speech, after which we will invite you to join us for a networking reception where you will be still able to enjoy the tables in the expo. So you can go and talk to some of the embassy representatives or diaspora representatives that you have not had time before and perhaps get some more insight into, into some of their funding or, or um, research, um, um, funding and research development um, of the country. So without further ado, I would like to invite to the stage uh, Ms. Tiffany Lowater, who is the Chief Communications Officer and the Director of the Office of Public Programs at the American Association for the Advancement of Science or better known as AAAS. I would like to thank Tiffany for accepting our invitation to come and be our keynote speaker today and um, take us to the world of science communication. Great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. Always nice to come down to this part of DC. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at AAAS and then hopefully talk about how that may impact or some opportunities that I see for communication more broadly and some challenges, obviously, that we all face. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the AAAS mission is uh, we're the world's largest general science society. We, uh, our mission is to advance science engineering innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people. Very small goal that we have for ourselves. Um, <laughs> But we are an international organization. That is something I wanted to mention. We have members not just in the United States, but also throughout the world. And many of us know, uh, know about us as because we publish science. Um, there's science journals, which we now have five journals. I'm going to talk a bit about communication at AAAS and what we're trying to do to help communication in other areas as well. So as you can see, we have many goals. I've bolded the ones, I'm not going to read through them all, that speak specifically to communication and public engagement. Because as the mission of our organization is to do communication and engagement, I actually find this to be one of the main challenges with a lot of institutions, let's say research institutions or other places where science is being done. The mission and the goals of the organization may not always be matched up to what it is they're trying to do. So we're actually trying to enhance communication among scientists, engineers, and the public, what we would call scientific communication. But we're also trying to increase public engagement in science communication with members of the public. So in some ways, there's a difference there, right? I think the journals primarily are talking scientific communication among scientists, although many of them are opening up and available for public audiences. But we need to think specifically, which public audiences are we trying to reach and how are we reaching them through science communication? So we use the public engagement framework at AAAS, and I don't know if any of you have seen something similar, probably I'm, I'm just guessing given the EU connections. Um, the, the, the conversations among scientists are great, but they're operating with a, within a bigger landscape. Um, we all exist within society, and we have scientific institutional pressures as well as the societal pressures on science. But then the connection to the audiences aren't always clear. So oftentimes when I talk to scientists about who they're communicating to, they'll say, oh, you know the people, either scientists or the public. Right? But they're not really thinking about who are those audiences in the public that they're trying to reach. Are there ways that they can make their work relevant to individuals such that they can have feedback and they can improve their own science through that? I think this is a huge shift for many people in the science community. Someone recently, I think the last panel was just talking about the one directional mentality of science communication. I think much of that is scientific communication. And what we're trying to do is get people to think more broadly about public communication of their science. Um, so when I, we give uh, workshops and we talk a lot and we work with scientists and institutions all the time, and I ask them, what's your goal? Because we can talk about messages and how to simplify and the jargon reduction of science and all of that's really wonderful. But if you're not thinking about what's your goal, what are you trying to accomplish, how are you going to measure it um, communication-wise and public engagement-wise, I'm not talking about your science goal, which is different. Uh, many scientists have not thought through what that means for them. So we actually work them through a process where they get to think about this and do a little bit of self-reflection. What is it that I'm trying to do? Many scientists will start off with things like improve public awareness of my topic. Well, that's great as a big, broad societal goal. What are you going to do as a person, as an individual, as an institution to make a, a contribution to that broad goal? What are the specific things that you can do? And how are you going to measure whether or not you've made an impact there? So the way that we, I'm going to talk a little bit about science communication at AAAS. 
Um, the way that we think about science communication is connecting scientists with journalists, policymakers, and other publics. And we define, we define them. We have programs in many different areas, including working with religious audiences. We have programs in seminaries. We have programs working with school children and teachers. But we are defining different audiences and defining how do we re meet goals that we have for each of those audiences. Um, we want to enhance communication among scientists, engineers, and among the public, including them in those discussions. And we also are very interested in raising the vis visibility of scientific research of science society issues worldwide. So there are research issues that we want to make sure people are aware of, but that we also want to make sure they understand how science connects to everyday life, how science can be used for decision making, how science can import um, ideas that can be useful for other areas of work. So the way that we do that is through a, a mechanism of different ways. Um, obviously, my, uh, my group at AAAS is responsible for media relations and social media for the organization and also for the journals, um, services and awards for journalists and scientists, um, and we also do public engagement programs. So one thing that we've been pretty active on recently um, is trying to be proactive and responsive to the many issues that are up upon us in, the, in this world and in this country at this time. Um, how does science impact society, and what are the impacts from society that are going to have impacts to science? These are the broader science society issues that I was talking about earlier. Um, we've been very active in terms of putting out statements and explaining why different actions by individuals or by governments can have implications for the scientific community. It's very challenging, I think, in this time to get attention to all of that because there are a lot of other things and a lot of other groups and a lot of other industries that are also feeling pressures. So one of the challenges that we found and trying to res be responsive to, how do we make sure that the science is part of the overall issues when they're being discussed? Um, we also want to make sure that you know, we're calling attention on social media, that we're allowing members and other people who are interested in science to be part of these discussions. Um, I think as a, as a practice, many scientists have been resistant in getting involved in public policy discussions. And so we see there are opportunities there for scientists who are willing and interested in doing that. We do a lot of training for scientists on how to talk to policymakers, what are the things you need to be thinking about, um, so that they go into these conversations understanding where their place is and what they could potentially impact and what they don't, you know, making them aware of what they don't know about the issues that are happening. Um, we've been doing a lot in social media. So Facebook, you know, everyone always talks about in communication, the pivot to video this year. So Facebook and many other places are uh, promoting the fact that you can have video conversations with people from all over the world. Um, it drives engagement on social media. And I just want to say that social media can be used for good. It's not always all potentially bad. Um, we, we are in an, at a time where that is a major form of communication. People are looking for ways to engage personally and individually. And I think um, as a scientific community, we need to be responsive to that. Um, someone once told me I was doing a workshop for scientists on social media, and they said, why would I possibly go on Twitter? What a complete use of waste of my time. And I said, well, it depends on what your goals are and the audiences that you're trying to reach. Do you want to be part of a conversation in a social media environment or not? That's up to you. Those are questions that you can ask yourself. But I would say that if scientists completely say, well, we're not going to use Twitter, we're not going to use these social media tools, other people are. <laughs> so you have to know that you are then abdicating your, your role in a social construct if you choose not to use the tools where other people are having conversations. Something to think about. This one was on um, uh, the DACA. Um, uh, this one was on the climate ch change assessment, which I could talk to you if any of you are interested in um, the national climate assessment, what we've been doing there. There was a lot of concern that the government may not actually publish the report. And so we wanted to be prepared for other ways to get the messages out about the national climate assessment. NOAA did end up having a press conference, which we were greatly relieved by. But of course, we're continuing to monitor issues on that. Um, and then this one is about, this one on my side, it doesn't have a, a, a thing um, about the, a DACA student who published an editorial in Science a couple weeks ago talking about the Dreamer um, thing that happened in the United States and advocating for scientists to get more involved in speaking out on those types of issues. So AAAS is kind of filling a space between the science and the um, um, societal issue community. Some scientists are comfortable in us talking about these types of things, and some aren't. And that's a conversation we continue to have internally. Um, the other thing we do a lot of is media outreach to science um, journalists. And I want to talk a bit about that because I think one of the major challenges that science faces is there's a decline in terms of um, how much science is in news publications in the United States. And I think in some parts of the world that's growing, which is great. In the United States, it's actually on decline. Much of that is because many places no longer employ science-specific journalists. And so we're trying to find new ways to reach the news media with 
conversations and issues about science. So we have uh, five journals currently. We have a team of staff. This is one of the things I wanted to advocate for. Communication takes people. It doesn't just happen. Um, and while it's wonderful that scientists do their own communication, oftentimes they need support to do that. They don't have time in their regular work to be thinking about all the issues and preparing for different communications opportunities. So we develop li lay language summaries and visuals. We do a lot of video and infographics, and I could talk with you if anyone who's interested about that. How do you make science compelling and interesting to people who aren't typically reading and, and paying attention to science? There's lots of ways you can do that visually, particularly um, these days, because people get lots of information online. We also run something called Eureka Alert. Has anyone heard of Eureka Alert in the room? So this is a press release distribution service that AAA has run for about 15 years now. Um, it's editorially independent. We do press releases for almost all of the journals and um, almost uh, every research institution that I'm aware of that does research science. Um, so we do uh, about 66 countries are involved in this, um, universities, medical centers, journals, government agencies, registrations free for reporters, and we serve about 13,000 reporters and freelancers from 92 countries. And this is a con continuously updated online service. So reporters have logins, they get embargoed information before if they're publicly available, it's a way for them to get information and news. It's also a great public website. We get millions of visitors a month who just go there to read the latest um, news in science. We have a new service, and I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Scyline. Any hand show of hands? So this is brand new. This started about six weeks ago. Um, and this was, as I was mentioning before, one of the challenges we see is the fact that many journalists that are looking for information are not necessarily science journalists, but they want to speak to scientists. They may not have the best sources at the universities to speak to. They may not even understand what kind of science they need for their story. They're just working on a story about water quality. I need a scientist to tell me if this is possible. Can this even happen? These would be more general assignment editors and reporters. So we started a new service to specifically reach out to those individuals in the United States. We have gotten some inquiries internationally or thinking about growing international, but that's a whole other issue because there are other groups that do these, this type of service internationally. Um, and I just wanted to mention it to you. It seems to be very popular so far. Um, the Savannah Morning News is a small publication in Savannah, Georgia. Um, some of the others are you probably know. They're more nationally known. We're, we're seeking to, as we grow, do many more of these Savannah Morning News type publications that it's getting to the less resourced reporters who are trying to do quick stories, but that uh, really impact their local community. And they wanna make sure they find good scientists who can speak well. This is one of the other things that we're doing as part of the service. We're actually vetting the scientists to be communicators. So we wanna make sure that when a local reporter calls that doesn't know much about the science, the scientists can explain it in a way and can be um, convincing and useful for the reporters. We also give out science journalism awards, so we recognize scientists every science journalists every year. Um, this is an international award. One of the reasons I'm mentioning it here is because um, I'm anyone from any country is welcome to uh, apply, and it, this is basically meant to recognize the best science journalism over the past year. There's a diversity of categories from online to children's news uh, to n large newspapers, small newspapers, um, lots of things there. And then we all gather them at the uh, AAAS annual meeting in February, which is a great opportunity for the international community of science journalists to talk with each other. Uh, I did also want to mention that AAAS has been doing quite a bit of work in public engagement with science. This is actually what brought me to AAAS almost 11 years ago now. Um, the idea that we could be having more of this multi-directional -di dialogue, that it didn't need to be a one-way conversation um, from scientists to people, whoever those people may be, um, I think many scientists, particularly these days, and we're finding this in terms of our surveys, younger scientists are very interested in making sure that their science connects to people, that it's not just about pursuing science for the, for the good of everything, but they want to make sure that it's used. And one of the ways to do that is to incorporate different kinds of perspectives into public conversations about issues. So many scientists are thinking about how can I do this in a more proactive way that can be helpful to my research, but also to the overall enterprise. Um, and recognizing that there are benefits, but also li risks and limitations to science. I think many scientists are stuck with that question whenever they do a public talk, or they have lots of things that they may not have even expected. And I think those are types of questions that scientists need to be thinking about proactively. Um, and then I also think we, we need to be informing the conversation with scientific evidence, speaking up for the fact that there is scientific evidence that we have can bring to bear on issues. Um, scientists alone are not going to solve all of the problems, right? That's not exactly what we're here for. But we're here to give information so that others can um, think of that information and make decisions. Um, and I think also responding to societal issues and concern is something that I think is really important. 
um, and is not always necessarily recognized within the scientific community in terms of advancement. Right? So how are we being responsive to when people come to us with their own problems and issues? And we recognize that there's a way that we need to incorporate that into a system that better values public engagement. Um, many scientists will come to me sometimes and say, but what if they say they don't like X, Y, or Z? <laughs> we don't want to fund that anymore, right? There's that whole conversation, I think, that happens. Uh, so I think that's something as a, as a community and as a society we need to reckon with. You know, what if, what if people decide they don't want to fund certain areas of research? What does that mean to the underlying scientific enterprise? How is it that we can have those conversations with people and not lead them to question um, even the validity of what it is that we do? But this is something that's happening already, I would argue. So we better be prepared and start thinking about how to really respond to this in a more proactive way. Um, we also do workshops for scientists. I actually brought some um, flyers, so if anyone's interested in these, I can give you them, or you can look up our website. So it's AAAS.org slash communicating science. Um, we've trained more than 5,000 scientists on how to talk about their science, um, and I think that's a really exciting opportunity for people who are thinking about this but aren't yet quite sure where to start. Uh, many scientists come to us and say, uh, I, w I have testimony to give next week, or I'm going to speak to a school group, or I have a media interview and I haven't done that before, or I have done it before and it went bad the five previous times. Can you please help me get better at this? Tell me what I'm doing wrong. So uh, we work with them on how to think about their goals, their messages, their audiences, um, and help them think through some of these things. Of course, this is a whole field of study. You know, there are people who study communication and science communication. But we're trying to bring this to the people who need it, so it's very practice-oriented, um, but using evidence to support the practice that we're, we're providing. Uh, and then we're starting to do additional modules in this. So as I mentioned, we're doing ones for working with religious audiences, working with policymakers, social media. Um, there's a lot of appetite, I think, for this kind of work. And we have lots of free resources on our website as well. So even if you can't come to the workshop, there's plenty that um, we provide for free. I mentioned before we have an annual meeting every year. This next meeting is going to be in Austin, Texas for the first time in February. So would welcome any of you to come if you're interested in talking about uh, policy issues. Um, Europe is typically involved quite readily in this um, meeting, as well as others from all around the world. It's a great opportunity to talk about science policy issues, but also science more generally. What are the biggest breakthroughs? Um, and we typically have a very high attendance of journalists at our meeting as well. It's a nice way to represent all sectors, uh, I think, in terms of engagement. So, and, I'm, and I realize that I went a little bit fast, so I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but I also didn't want to hold you if other people are <laughs> trying to leave for the end of the day. Um, my, my last thing would be, um, oh, actually, this is something I wanted to remind you, if you, in case you weren't aware of. A Pew Research Center does a lot of work in terms of uh, making publicly available survey data, and they've done a lot of work in science recently. So this particular study was published in September. It's on their website if you Google it. Um, science news and information today. And this is specific to the American audience, so I'm going to qualify with that, although they do a lot of work with international groups as well. You can, you can find by city. You can find that about 17% are what huge terms active science news consumers. That's not a huge pr proportion of the population. Uh, about 36% are saying they get science news, however they might define that, several times a week. Uh, and then 30% get science news because they're looking for it. So I would argue that we need to get better at both helping those who are looking for science news, as well as those who may not know that they're interested in it, um, but may there's particular issues that may be of interest to them. So how can we make our information relevant to people such that they come across something and maybe they don't even know that it's science news. Wouldn't that be great? It's just information. Um, so I think that that's the opportunity and the challenge that's um, in front of us currently. And there's a lot more information on their website if you're interested in it. Um, so my challenge to you is that this is the best time to be doing this kind of work. There's a lot of need out there in terms of communication and public engagement. Um, but there's also a lot of interest and I think uh, opportunities for the scientific community to get more involved. And I've been encouraged even in the last five years and definitely within the last year of seeing people really um, step up and say, what can I do to be more active in um, promoting the work that I do, but also understanding what public thinks about this work and how we can get more involved, them more involved in research. And that's me. So that's my contact information. And I am going to stay for a little bit, um, but I'd be happy to add, answer any questions. Or if people have things they want to talk about relevant to this topic, I'd be happy to. Hello. 
Um, uh, I'm Mina Farm, I'm the counselor for science and technology at the French Embassy. Well, uh, I have two questions. Um, you mentioned the uh, social networks, etc. Um, what's the position, what could be the role of AAAS in this era of alternative truth? Of alternative truth, yeah. Right. Yes. And uh, the second question is maybe a difference in, in culture. For instance, in France, we have mainly a public institution, and when you are a, once, you are, once you are a scientist, you belong to a, a given institution. So how, will you, uh, how would you consider the individual communication from an individual scientist? And the uh, message from the institution sometimes is not exactly right. uh, on the same line. That's true. So, um, so you asked first about alternative truths or um, fake news, hashtag fake news. So uh, this is a big challenge, I think, for the community, but I also think for society in general. I think it's much bigger than just the science community, this issue. Uh, I think the, the thing that we can continue to do is um, talk about what we know to be true and what the value of evidence is and that there's a difference between evidence and opinion. And also marking when those opinions happen, right? That not everything that scientists says is pure truth. Right? This needs to be also discussed. Um, scientists need to qualify when they're talking about opinion or things that they think that are not quite um, vetted by scientific reality. So I think this is a big part of the challenge that um, individuals face as well as institutions, I think, but also the broader um, discussion of democracy. I mean, this is not a new problem. I think it's become increasingly obvious within the last year that this is a problem we're facing in our country. But this is something that's been happening throughout the world be beginning of time. Um, and, and we may be going through another time with a cyclical. We may be going through another time where that's something that needs to happen. I would say that there, um, oftentimes people are become somewhat complacent in terms of uh, assuming that the truth will speak for itself. Um, and I think we may be going through a time where it becomes very clear that that's not the case. And so we need to be very active in terms of um, talking about what we what we know to be true. I don't know how it's to, so AAAS has been pretty um, outspoken in the last year, uh, and I think working with other groups and communities, so there's a lot of things that you see publicly, and then there's a lot of things that happen individually, as you all know, um, between, um, between groups. So I think that's important to keep in mind, too. Uh, and then your second question was about the difference between a, a scientist, an individual scientist, and an institution message. Yes, this is a big challenge, too, I think. So um, particularly for scientists who may be starting out, um, you know, there are often in the United States, and I'm for sure in other countries as well, grad students who want to speak out on issues, but they're concerned that it potentially may harm them or their institution or their career. So I think that's something that has to do with the self-reflection piece. So one of the things that we want people to be thinking about is how is this, gonna, how is this going to, um, what potential impacts could come of this to, your per to you personally as well as to your institution. And I think every individual has to make that um, decision for themselves, um, determining where they think they can fit within what they're doing for their institution. Uh, I know many individual scientists feel very strongly about academic freedom and that they are going to speak what they want to do, and so that's a decision that they make for themselves. And then there are others who feel like they want to just kind of go with what the institution, and they're comfortable doing that. And I think each, each and this is true of anyone, and you have to what are where the risks and benefits to you as an individual. But it's a challenging situation. I would say AAAS is hard too because there are differences of opinion within the community and we're trying to represent all of science and so we weigh, we have to weigh those as well. Yes. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Um, you mentioned that you give courses on science communication for scientists. Could I ask you, what would be the top three tips for a scientist who has to make a presentation to a general audience or indeed to any audience? Thank yeah, you. So I w my thing always is like, who are you speaking to? What's who's your audience? Or who do you think the audience is? And what do you know about them? Um, I think m many scientists start with the messages. Like, this is what I want them, the people, whoever it is I'm talking to, to get out of my presentation. But if you start with the audience and what it is you're trying to get across to that audience, then that will help you with the messages. Um, and so that would be probably my top tip. Like really think about who the audience is. Recognize that the presentation that you give to your peers doesn't need to just be reworked for a policymaker audience or reworked for a public audience. You actually need to probably flip the whole thing. Uh, we, we show a slide in one of ours. I didn't bring it today. I was thinking of it when someone mentioned something. Um, but it's basically uh, the typical scientific paper, which is you know, a lot of background. And then at the very end of the paper, it says, and this is what we found. Whereas most public audiences want, what do, what did you find? Why should I care? What, how does it, what does it mean to me? 
And so the more that you can connect um, your work or what it is that you're trying to say to an audience that you, you, you can understand, the more trust you'll build because they recognize you're trying to make a connection there. Um, I believe there's a thing in the media industry that's like W-I-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? You know, that's, that should be your bottom line. Always be thinking, the person that you're speaking to, whether it's an individual conversation or a larger, a larger group, what's in it for them? Why, why should they even care about this? Um, I would also say conveying your passion. Many scientists um, are so used to the peer mentality of being reviewed by other scientists, and they want to be come across as very serious um, and very official. And I think when scientists can convey a little bit of the fact that they're a human being and they have a life outside of science, hopefully, at least some, some kind of life, um, and also the, the enthusiasm they have for their subject. I think that comes across, and people will listen to you if they think it's something they're really interested in. I think those would be my top tips. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I think I will would like to have one of those workshops on communicating with politicians, actually. I'm a political mm -hmm. scientist, and I sometimes think I have great ideas, but they just have to listen to me. <laughs> Perhaps not the right approach, but I think I could learn something there. Um, I think science communication also to the, the audiences, or whether it's a particular or a general audience, has become more and more important. Also, if you look at, for example, getting funding, the most schemes, also European funding schemes, really want to have an impact and have you explain what you're going to do in that respect in your proposal. Um, the other thing I experience as a researcher is, I mean, I have tenure, but I know many people don't. And if you want to get a permanent contract, my experience is that, um, so communicating your results with larger audiences apart from the scientific one can break your career but not make it, mm -hmm. if I can put it that way. So what is most important if you want to make a career in most disciplines is you have to publish. And whether it's books or journal articles, it differs per discipline, but publishing is the first right. important criterion. Second one, you have to teach well. So your um, evaluations have to be off the charts if possible. And I mean, there is a lot of competition for many positions, and if you're good at both of those things, that's usually more important, and research is the most important one. And then people start to look at, okay, and how do you do with communicating with uh, audiences beside the scientific disciplines? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really too bad. So in the, um, if we look at how we are judged in these proposals, it is important. But if you look at actually getting a job, at a university, somehow it's not that important anymore, so you have to do it, and they would like you to be good at it, but you do it in your free time. That's what it boils down to usually, and it takes a lot of time if you want to do it well. So um, this is more of a comment than a question, I guess, so I do hope that universities in their employment policies will take more account of this important aspect of our research as well. And uh, so if some researchers are not as cooperative as communications people would like us to be, this is probably one of the reasons. Uh, so I think there's a couple other things too related to that. One is that um, if, if your research is covered in media, it actually leads to greater citation rates. This is something there's, there's been research done, and there's some research that shows that additional media com social media conversation leads to greater citation rates. So there is a, a relationship there. Um, I think one of the challenges is, like you're saying, many scientists don't have supports within their institutions or I would say um, they don't even know of the supports that they already have. Uh, so we've worked with um, in a, a couple different programs trying to have scientists identify what exists within their already existing networks and then what additional things do they need in order to do high quality communication and public engagement. Um, many of the scientists that come to our workshops will ask them, do you know that there's a communications office in your university? And like, you know, a few people hold up their hands. It's not even something that enters into the realm of possibilities for many of them. So I think uh, there's it's on both sides. I think the individuals having a better understanding of what exists, and then also the institutions and the infrastructure having a better uh, understanding of what's needed in order to be really good at this. And it's something that we've been working on both sides. I think there's the individual problem, which I was talking about with the workshops, and there's absolutely the institutional problem, which we've been working with through partnerships with other groups. Uh, in the back here. Yeah. Uh, hi, Joe Sparling from CAPS. Uh, fantastic talk, and uh, high praise to AAAS. I think. Wow, I don't usually get told I'm being too quiet. 
Um, uh, high praise to you guys. A a AAAS has done some fantastic work, and uh, CAFS will be stealing more things from your website, apparently. Uh, <laughs> I just wonder if, uh, speaking about knowledge translation, uh, in Canada I've noticed this, and I don't know if it's global, uh, this seems to be becoming a bigger part of applications a lot of times, so more and more of the grants and fellowships that uh, we're writing uh, require some kind of knowledge translation plan. And I wonder if you uh, can let us know, does AAAS have specific recommendations around that kind of thing as well for the people, the burgeoning scientists who usually start cursing when they see a KT section on an application? Sure. So, I mean, I think there's a couple different ways to look at it because I think different groups are looking for different things. So we're trying to figure out how does this fit into, but I like your point in terms of how does this fit into what you need to do in order to be successful in whatever it is your goal, your end up goal is. So knowledge transfer is one area for that. Um, in the U.S., we also have broader impact statements. So um, in NSF, anyone who applies for National Science Foundation funding has to say what are the broader impacts of this work. Much of that, the communications and engagement piece could fit under that. There's also the possibility of doing um, uh, more engaged scholarship um, or uh, knowledge co-production. So working with communities so that you're both learning from each other at the same time. An example of that, we were working with someone who's working um, with oyster farmers and she wants to understand what's happening to the oysters, what the effects of climate in that local environment are. And the oyster farmers want to know what's happening to the oysters so that they can have better and more oysters for, for food production. So I think uh, there's a lot of ways that scientists can be working with public groups, wh however you may define them, um, that can be useful to your career. And I would actually like to think that there are ways that we could be doing it in ways that are co-beneficial, that there are things that people need from scientists and there are things that scientists would like to have from people, that we could be sharing information on both sides. The knowledge transfer is a good piece of that too. Um, but I think part of this is self-reflection. You know, if I want to be an engaged scholar or if, if I want to work with public groups more specifically, more directly, what are the opportunities that are available to me and how can I increase my skills and what I need in order to be successful in that space? Thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, I just wonder, what is your opinion on this growing industry of grant writing professionals, publication writing professionals? And some scientists, and I know many of them, and especially those who, for whom English is not native language, that use those services and also they actually hide their science behind those services. Uh, and sometimes interpretation of their signs doesn't correspond to the initial, you know, scientific, um, I would say, value of the invention or scientific project. So what is your opinion on those professional services? Uh, so I think it depends on uh, like anything and it, you know a group um, if they work with you well and um, making sure you check their work and that it's actually relevant. I mean I, I don't know if I would speak about services specifically but one of the things we always talk with scientists in our workshop about is um, if someone gives you a recommendation of a better way to explain your work and you don't agree with it, don't use it. <laughs> you, you are responsible for the communication of your own work. Um, so this is something I think that happens also in university environments sometimes. I used to, c I work for a uh, communications office in university, and sometimes the communications office wants to say it a certain way, and the scientist wants to say it a different way, and there's this discussion that has to happen. So I think there are ways that scientists can improve their communication skills so that they can better advocate for making the case for why they're describing it a certain way. At the same time, it's helpful for professional communicators to work with scientists to get them to think about their research in ways that are more publicly accessible. So there's a balance there. Um, I, I don't, like the specific industries I can't comment on, but I do think that there, there's a need for scientists even to advocate for themselves, um, to say this is exactly what I'm trying to say. Please help me say it in a way that's more publicly relevant and accessible. At the same time, making sure that, that whatever the end product is, is accurate and that they feel comfortable having that be a representation of their work. It's, a, it's an ethical thing, right? Um, there's ethics in this too. Uh, scientists could hype their work. They could say, oh, in five years, we're going to have X, Y, or Z. Is that true or not? You know, that, that's something that a scientist has to think about. Is, it, is this something that's a proper, um, accurate representation of my work or not? Actually, the question was, uh, 
there are scientists who want to learn how to communicate their science. Some are natural and they do it very well originally. And on it's on one hand. On the other hand, there are professional services yeah. that do it. So how the scientist who is not perfect, definitely he's, he or she can be a good scientist but not perfect communicator and not perfect grant writing, grant, grant writer. So how would this scientist compete with someone who does it professionally, yeah. grant writer? And by the way, institutions offer these services. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I think Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank I think you very that's much. a challenging one in terms of individual situations. Um, just to add to um, the previous comments and exchanges, uh, I think to me as a scientist who is a non-native English speaker, uh, I do I do face these challenges, and I've been told by reviewers that this this paper needs to be uh, edited by somebody who knows better English. Basically, uh, I, I do think that's a challenge, and uh, I don't think it's the main threat when it comes to accuracy of reporting science, because I think the main threat comes from the scientists themselves, whether uh, they want to kind of amplify their message. Um, uh, and then some people do it by themselves and some people do it with the help of uh, professional writers. Uh, with that said, I think the main kind of distortion of the message comes from uh, mass media. And, you know, as, as a cancer biologist, I can tell you that uh, if I believed every time the New York Times or uh, any other major news source would say new cure of, uh, for cancer, I would be unemployed. Um, so I think that's kind of the main message, that when people want clicks, uh, when, when um, commercial institutions want clicks online, uh, they can make that happen, and that's when kind of the message gets distorted to the general public. Uh, not, not I, think, I think still in the scientific community, people can assess more or less uh, how accurate this is, uh, or how ac accurately the data is being reported uh, in the text. Uh, but that's, that's just my opinion, by the way. And that's a common question. Just checking. I, I hear what you're saying in terms of the media, and this is kind of saying about hype or the way potentially the way the reporting happens. But I do think scientists have a role to play in terms of trying to help with that. And there are strategies for, uh, particularly when scientists are involved in interviews, trying to assess the um, what are you getting out of this interview, and uh, you know trying to place um, qualifications within reason. I think. But that helps, it helps to be a good communicator in order to negotiate that. We have one last question okay. here, please. Thank you very much. I'm afraid it's me again. But I, I, I think it's a fantastic discussion, a, a really interesting discussion. Um, one thing that just comes to mind is, is the, the tension or the, 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 the between social media and the facility to just put anything out and um, and the reality. And I think sometimes, I mean, and you rightly in your presentation point out how great it would be if people sought out scientific information. But there's the opposite of that as well. That there's too much, I mean, there's an awful lot of information. And sometimes it's conflicting information. And I, I mean, the, uh, the obvious um, question, I mean, y the, the previous speaker spoke about, about um, cancer research. But the other obvious one is about diet. Every time you open a magazine or a newspaper, you're getting different um, um, in, um, advice. And it's all coming from scientists. And, and I think sometimes maybe, <laughs> maybe there's something to be said for having less scientific information out there in its raw and un... Um, or, uh, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that sometimes scientific information needs a little bit of time yeah. to become really uh, um, useful to society. I and that maybe this push of putting out scientific information is, is yeah, maybe I a little bit premature saying. sometimes. I also think, um, you know, seeing it from a media perspective, so I try to look at both sides, that they want to report on what's new. Um, so, you know, uh, 
it, this is a challenge, I think, within there's a tension there, definitely within the science, um, as opposed to the reporter or uh, someone who's looking for what's new about this information. Um, so I hear what you're saying. Um, I also think that there's a lot of value in terms of having vetted scientific information published. You know, there's a question, and somebody was talking earlier about um, open science and you know doing everything very openly versus giving scientists time to actually look and review papers and actually make sure that they there's some credibility within the information. So that's a whole other conversation we could have, and I'm not going to open it up now. Maybe we could talk about that over drinks at the reception. Um, but uh, I think that there there is something to say about um, especially like the things like diet, nutrition, um, things that directly impact people, health information, um, making sure people have what they need in order to make good decisions. I mean, that is what, in the end, that, you know, I think science is helping to give information so that people can make good decisions and whatever good they may decide, but science doesn't decide what good the good decisions are. People decide what good decisions are. Um, but, you know, that's a, a, now that everything's available on the internet, there's a lot of good and not so good, in, you know, quality and not quality information. And many people are not getting access to the kinds of quality information they need in order to make decisions. They're not even seeing the New York Times when they go and look for news. So that's the world we live in, and we have to figure out ways to fix it. <laughs>